I just want to say a few words about Dr. Shaheen. I know he's well recognized, but um, it's hard not to say so a few words. He's an internationally acclaimed author and media critic. He's an expert on media stereotypes and has written, lectured, and advised extensively on the subject matter. Uh, he makes regular appearances on national television and radio programs. His work illustrates that damaging racial and ethnic stereotypes of Arabs, Asians, Blacks, Native Americans, and others injure innocent people. He explains why negative images persist and provides workable solutions to help shatter misconceptions. Before September 11, Shaheen examined Hollywood's characterizations of Arabs and Muslims as violent, as the enemy, and as the other. Real Bad Arabs is the result of his comprehensive study of over 1,000 movies. After September 11, Shaheen finds the same stereotypes at play. Nearly all of Hollywood's post-9-11 films legitimize a view of Arabs as villains, sheiks, billionaires, terrorists, bombers, and ballet dancers. The main question that he will address tonight probably is, when will prejudices against Arabs and Muslims eventually dissipate? How much longer will media images pollute viewers' minds worldwide with these stereotypes? Other groups shattered ugly myths, and so can we. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Well, I want to, heartfelt thanks to you, Lena, uh, the staff at LAU, uh, my friends with the American University of Beirut, Ada, Ava, uh, friends like Dick Hobson, Hamilton Fisher, and others that are here that I've known for many, many years. The reason, one of the reasons we featured the film of a young image maker tonight is because Back in 1974, I was teaching basic courses in journalism in the Midwest. Television production, history of broadcasting, children's programming, images of nuclear war films. I was very happy. There were no problems in my life. Everyone loved me, almost everyone. And then one day, <clears throat> I received a letter in the mail. Dear Professor Shaheen, we're pleased to inform you, this was in 1974, that you are a recipient of a Fulbright grant to teach mass communications at the American University of Beirut. And I did something then that I've never forgotten. A friend told me, he said, whenever you have good news, shout it out. So I jumped out in the hall and I yelled at the top of my voice, yippee! You know, and no one knew what was going on. We, I was going to Lebanon back to my roots, where I had family, and to teach at the American University of Beirut. I had never met a Muslim. I knew absolutely nothing about the Middle East. I remember going to Washington, D.C., being briefed on my visit. And at the end of my briefing, I said, to the, I, said I have a few questions. And the State Department gentleman said, well, what are they? And I asked, and he said, well, I can't answer that. And I said, why not? He said, I've never been to Lebanon. So he was giving it to me all from, you know, from the literature. So I arrive in Beirut, this naive American. The only thing Arabic that I knew, I knew the foods. I knew the bad words. <laughs> I went to church, you know, I knew how to hymn a couple couple of songs. My grandfather was a chanter at the, at the Kinesa, and some of the, some of the hymns I could, I could go along with. That's all I knew, you know, completely ignorant about the culture, about the people. And AUB somehow changed my life that year in Lebanon. I'm not so sure I appreciate what AUB did because <laughs> From that time on, it became a very uphill struggle. Just before leaving for Lebanon, my children had discovered some very bad Arabs in cartoons. And I had taken notes at that time. And I thought, well, maybe I'll write an article on TV's images of Arabs. And I put all those notes together. Hmm? Now remember, I knew nothing. I mean, this was just, just notes. I put them together. 
and I put them in my suitcase, and then in Beirut I finish the article. And all of a sudden, in April, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, April 1975, I gave a talk at the AUB Alumni House on Bliss Street on perceptions of Arabs in American popular culture. We had people from our embassy there, the Minister of Information was there. The place was packed. And I thought, wow, you know, maybe I should pursue this. You know, look at this, you know. I got very excited. And we began traveling. We go to Saudi Arabia. We visit the camps in the south. We go to Anakanafani's camp in Beirut. I go to Jordan. You know, all these places. And all of a sudden, they're saying, gee, you know, I see his, uh, American planes flown by Israeli pilots dropping bombs on Beirut. All of a sudden, there was this awakening. And I came home, and I wrote my first article, just like this seven-minute film called The TV Arab in 1975. I guess I finished it in the fall of 75. And no one would publish it. So I resubmitted it in 1976, and no one would publish it. And I resubmitted it in 1977, and no one would publish it. And I resubmitted it in 1978, and finally, finally, it was published. And I think, you know, you say you learn from adversity. And I think the fact that there was so much antagonism and so much prejudice that somewhere in my roots, from my mother, from my grandparents, somewhere maybe from the cedar trees. I think a, a cedar tree had somehow found its way to my village. And, you know, the roots of a cedar tree grabbed hold of me and said, you cannot let this happen. I decided to pursue it. And at the university where I was once very popular, I was still popular, but I was now the Arab professor. And my research was no longer considered viable or important. It was considered Arab propaganda. An African-American scholar could do research on images of blacks. A Jewish-American scholar could look at Jews. An Asian scholar could look at Asians. But an Arab-American scholar looks at Arabs, and all of a sudden he's a propagandist. And so the journey from 1974 up to Real Bad Arabs, how Hollywood vilifies the people, and the exhibit, if you haven't seen the exhibit, by all means take a look at the exhibit in the back that New York University has put together, has been fraught with many, let's just say it has not been easy, but what, what has kept me going is, is belief in, in, in young people. And, and the fact that young people that are subjected to these images and who are more media aware than my generation, you know, we were not so tuned in to media. We were more concerned about doing other things. You know, a, a hufflow was more important than worrying about a stereotype, you know, for some strange reason. But the young people are not content to sit down. And so, in terms of the future, I can only say to you, this documentary I worked on for off and on with the book and the documentary 20 years. I looked at all 1,200 films. I analyzed them all myself with the help of my beautiful wife who was always at my side. I couldn't have done it without her. And the only reason I worked so hard on this is I felt that I had to do more to prove that this really existed. That I couldn't do it halfway. I couldn't stop at 600 films and let it out. I had to go all the way to read all the reviews at the Library of Congress, to go to research centers all across the country to take notes, to go to the Library of Congress with my wife and sit there and look at these images over and over again, to buy DVDs at garage sales and turn them on, and then I'd look at a film and I'd get an upset stomach because the images were so horrific. What you see in the film are clips from about 60 films. What we're talking about are 1,200 films. And now the uh, Arabophobia has spread, as we know, to Islamophobia. 
And now, you know, it, it's sort of like if you, you could be from Pakistan, you could be from Russia, you, you know, if you're a Muslim, you're evil. It, it's intensified. You, the Arabs are still villains, Arab Muslims, but it's, the base has broadened. But what, what happens is we have to bring about a change, and that change can only come through young people. You know, we have the collection at New York University, we have up-and-coming young image makers who want to make a difference, who work very hard to make a difference. And, and so this is the future. The future rests really with the, with the young. And it's our job, the senior statesmen and the senior stateswomen, those of us with gray hair, no hair, and hair that's gray that's dyed, you know, to encourage these young people and to support them so that they can make a difference. That's how every other group has done it. You know, no one came to the rescue of African Americans. Some people did. There was a great Jewish producer by the name of Sheldon Leonard who created a series called I Spy with Bill Cosby. Sheldon Leonard was very liberal. and He really did a lot to advance uh, the image. Never got enough credit of, of African Americans on television. And uh, producer Stanley Kramer did some, there were a few, but basically African Americans had to do it themselves. Asians, Jews, they had to work to correct the image. And we've not worked hard enough to really do anything. We need to help those of us who want to make a difference. And the whole purpose in life is to make a difference. We have to understand. I'll leave you with a couple of things, okay, and before we have the questions. Images, entertainment, plays a more important role in propaganda than news because it's not perceived as information. The movies of Leni Reifenstahl, the German propaganda filmmaker, her films were more effective than any German propaganda movies. Okay? Entertainment. Almost every entertainment show, I mean, look at Madam Secretary. Look at all these shows on television that have these sort of Arab villains that keep popping in. You can't turn on TV any week without seeing some Arab bad guys. There they are, in some form or another, popping up. And what, what the problem is that we are, the other problem is that we American Arabs and American Muslims are invisible. The equivalent of a Ralph Nader or a Michael DeBakey. Hmm? Wonderful men and women who have accomplished a great deal in life in our country, for our country. We don't see them in doctor shows, lawyer shows. We don't see the women. We don't see architects. We don't see a poet like Natalie coming in. We don't see anyone called uh, Lila Rafiti or Elsie Rome, you know, or, um, or, or, or a uh, Salah Nasrallah. They, they, don't, they don't exist on television. There are no characters like that. And, and, and there has never been a concentrated effort to make that happen. It's, we're excluded from the cultural mainstream. So instead of being presence, instead of having an American presence, which we rightfully deserve and should have in our culture, we have the presence of the radicals in the form of Muslim extremists and Arab extremists. That's the presence. And that spills over to us. And at some point, before it's too late, before more people get killed, like those students in North Carolina. Students in North Carolina. Three, what? Kill them. This has to change. And it can only change by working together and by assisting young people and guiding them. What we do not see, said the great journalist Edward R. Murrow, is often as important, if not more important, than what we do see. And we do not see, as I speak in the documentary, the Arab humanity. Hmm? Hmm? You'll see the Arab humanity. I'll end on an uplifting note. I've seen clips of it. I haven't seen all. The new Gibran film is coming out. And I've seen clips of it. I haven't seen it all, so, but I'm sure it'll be very nice. You know. So that's something to take comfort in. So having said that, 
I can't sing, my Dubka steps are out of tune, but I can answer questions. Hi, I'm Hamilton Fisher. Um, I live here in New York, and political power, that's really the only way you can get change. Yeah. Um, but I never, I, are there any Arab American politicians in, in, uh, in D.C. or in local government? Uh, uh, is it growing? I never hear anything. I watch a lot of media, but I never hear anything about that. Uh, it's, it's minimal. It, it, it's political power and media power. They're together. I think you need both. In your research for the film, did you do any research of um, European-made films, and did you find similar prejudices in European-made films, or do you find this to be a more uniquely American prejudice? Well, I would have loved to have done European films, but I mean, after 1,200 American films, there just wasn't enough steam in the engine. No, I do in Real Bad Arabs talk about some French films where it was just as bad. And one of the best films of all that I recommend is a German film called Ali, Fear Eats the Soul. It's a Werner Fassbinder film. And it's the story of a real macho Arab in Germany who meets this dumpy looking German woman who's older than him and falls in love with her. And it is a great story because he gets picked on by his friends and she gets disowned by her family. It's, it's a classic film. I'd love to show it sometime. It's a beautifully made film. Ali, A-L-I, Fear Eats the Soul. And it's one of my favorites. Since you started looking at this, I think, in 1974, 1975, has it gotten worse, better? Has it gone through phases, waves? Um, the reason I mention that is just from my own perspective, it, it seems as if, and maybe this, this may be a bit naive, but after September 11th, we went through a period as a country here where there was a tendency to go extreme, but everyone was telling everyone else, don't do that. And that in the past couple years, not, maybe not because people inherently believe that, that we don't have an issue, that there are no stereotypes, but because we're told that to be politically correct, you don't have to, you can't say these things that that has led to some changes, maybe more superficial than, than otherwise, but that's where my question stems from. Do you see a difference? I, I, that's a very good question. I think the arc goes like this. After 9-11, most major feature films backed away from the issue. However, television came at it with a vengeance. And it, it really, I, I, I cite two boogie, boogie, net, uh, I, I cite two villains. Fox News, I'm sorry if somebody watches Fox. Uh, if, you, if you listen to, if you were to monitor, and if I had the money, I, I would, I would uh, hire some young graduate students to tape it 24-7 and to put together a documentary based on what they say about Arabs and Muslims. And I, I, I will tell you this, it will come out, it'll knock your socks off. Little snippets here and there throughout, it's there every day on Fox. They know what they're doing. Anyway, Fox News and the television series 24. <coughs> what 24 did is it injected for the first time in commercial television Arab Americans and Muslim Americans as terrorists. And then other networks picked up on that. And they began to advance the same thing. And so all of a sudden we became bad guys. And that's intensified on television and on Fox News. So much so that I think there is more hatred and fear now of Muslims than ever before than ever before, because no one is speaking from the, stop, from the top to say stop it. No one. And there's no presence. I look at CNN, where are the Arab Americans? Occasionally they'll let Dino Bidalo say something. But, but that's it. You know? You know, why, why isn't there someone there that's an Arab American? I know, you know, there just isn't. 
You know, it's like, it's like Arab Americans need not apply. You know, no Irish need apply, you know, a hundred some odd years ago. Like, we can't do it, you know, like we have an agenda. If you go on the air and your name is Abdul Latif Hunedi. Good evening, here, it's Abdul Latif Hunedi with the evening news. <gasps> <laughs> My God, you know, the jihadists have taken over, you know. Have to change his name. It's Al Hunedi. Hi, everybody. With the news, you know. So we have this problem. So we just have to be aware of it. And, 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 and the change has to come, really, through, I think, gatherings such as this, where you plant seeds. Oh, I've dedicated my life to planting seeds in the hope that young people will pick up those seeds and move forward with them. And, you know, it's always been that way. Change is always difficult. But it'll happen. Yes? Apparently, the situation in the Middle East has gone worse. And uh, having said this, is there, any, is, there, is there a problem? I guess there's a problem with the... Or what is the role of organic intellectuals? if we can still talk about organic intellectuals. Is there, is there a problem with intellectual method? Or, I don't understand, so, because, the, the, as I said, the situation has been worse in the in, in Middle East. So, what is the role of intellectuals in this case? Thank you. I think the role of, of people, I won't, I'll stay away from the intellectuals. I don't know what any, what an intellectual is. I've never met one, I'm not one, you know. I, I never look at it that way, you know. But I think the role is to speak out when you see an injustice and you try to change things. And when there's violence, whether it's committed by an Arab, a Muslim, uh, an Israeli, whomever, you speak out. And not only when it concerns your own group or your own religion. I think that's the key. Not to remain silent not to remain silent. You know, had I remained silent when the article was not published, I mean, I wouldn't be here tonight. You know? Hmm? Young lady in the back. Right here. Oh, here, sorry. Another Hello. young lady. <laughs> Hi, young lady in the front. Uh, you mentioned that you are, uh, first of all, thank you very much for a wonderful evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, that you are optimistic. Yes. And I feel very pessimistic. Yes. Seeing what's going on around us in the Middle East. Now we are giving fuel uh, on a plate, on a platter, to dehumanize us even more and more. We're doing it to ourselves. Yes. I don't know how you feel about it. Well, if I tell you I'm always optimistic, that would not be the truth. I think the future belongs to the optimists, to those who have hope. Because if you are not optimistic, and if you don't have hope, you stop fighting. And if you stop fighting, the bad people win. That's the only reason. They win. Because they work to make it, you know, you can't let them triumph over, over you, over us. That's, that's why. Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Shaheen. Thank you so much for this fascinating lecture and this amazing film. Um, so this might be a little bit of a tricky subject to approach, but oh. you, mentioned, you mentioned yourself that you were Lebanese Christian originally. Yes. Um, so many Lebanese Christians would like to distinguish themselves than their Arab heritage. And I was wondering how you feel about this distinction and whether you feel that actually as Christians we have a responsibility to reclaim actually and say that we are also Arab. I don't know if my question is clear. I don't try to speak for anyone but myself. I know there are some Lebanese Christians. I went to a Maronite Catholic church for 25 years, although I'm Orthodox. I mean, since we're getting personal, you know. <laughs> And it didn't bother me, and there were some people, I'll tell you a funny story. 
they had me speak one night. This is how, oh, you're going to love this. I haven't told this story in a long time. Thank you. We're at this big affair, and I give this lecture, and at the, after the lecture, we're sitting around this table, and, you know, we're having dinner. And I said to uh, someone at the end, pass the Syrian bread. Aha. Uh -huh. Well, when I was growing up, we made Syrian bread. I, this, it was the Syrian Orthodox Church, the Syrian Orthodox Youth Organization. That's what I knew. I, I didn't, you know, pass the Syrian bread. I'm talking about bread here, not politics. <laughs> well, one of the very strict Maronite Catholics in the church, not all were strict, but she was very Lebanese and very Maronite, Jack. This is a Maronite Catholic church, and here we pass the Lebanese bread. Today now with the presence of ISIS, yes. they actually thrive on negative media, right. uh, negative image, images of Arabs, of Islam, right. and you know, it gets all mixed up and people associate Islam with ISIS. Do you have any recommendations on how we can actually... I think every time there's an act, an ISIS act of violence, there should be Muslim Americans and Arab Americans countering it on television. And the network news people have a responsibility to have them there to have them as guests to say how horrible this is and how this goes again. It should be immediate. It should be absolutely immediate. Hi, uh, Dr. Shaheen. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Um, I have a question about the controversy over American Sniper. What is your opinion on that? And what do you think the Arab American community should do when such controversies arise? I mean, in one case, it is a story about somebody who held these views, so we can't I don't know if you can say it's negatively portraying. It's based on someone's life story. Um, but just can you let me know what you think about that controversy and then what do you think when such something happens again, what should the Arab American, Muslim American community do? The clips that I saw and the reviews that I read, there are other servicemen who go over there who tried to help Iraqis and did some very good things. And to show this kind of film, it's too late once the film comes out. What I would do if I found the film to be as objectionable as I think it is, is I would try to arrange a meeting with the producers and the writers and try to get a make good film. Something that humanizes the people rather than portrays it portrays them in that light. But in order to do that, you have to have organizations in Washington working together. There's got to be a will. And in order to have organizations working together, you have to have people supporting the organizations. So it's a, but that's what I do. I mean, I've always felt that most people are good people. Not all, it's not always that way, but if you approach them in a reasonable manner and you have a dialogue, there was, to my knowledge, no dialogue. And forget about the letters. You have a meeting face to face and you explain the situation. You explain that as a result of that film, all of the discriminatory acts that took place. You explain it. Eastwood, in the past, has done some very good films that have humanized minority groups. You mentioned that your hope lies with the next generation, with the young people. Right. Well, they have a whole new way to communicate, and that's social media and the internet, and it keeps evolving. And, and uh, does that scare you, or does that give you more hope? It gives me more hope because you can make a film now for under a million dollars, a good film. A good film. You don't need a lot of money. And if it's a really good film, it can, it can change things. I, I want to conclude on, on, um, on a short poem. Uh, one of my dearest friends was killed by uh, Jewish extremists. At the same time, Leon Klinghoffer was killed by Arab extremists on the Achille Laro. His name was Alex Oda. And he worked in California 
for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. And Alex equated stereotypes with lies. And he wrote this beautiful poem. Lies are like dead ashes. When the wind of truth blows, the lies are dispersed like dust and disappear and disappear. So that's my, my hope. Yeah. So anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>